Welcome to Scan Squad. I'm Patty Teal, and I'm here again this week with Deputy District Attorney Vicki Johnson, who shares scams so that we can be aware of them and avoid them. And today she has a very special guest who is fairly regularly on the show. We love having him on. It's Dayton Aldrich. He helps with restitution. I'll let Vicki introduce him with his exact title. Yeah. Dayton is our restitution specialist. So if you've been victimized by some kind of a fraud or a scam, you have suffered from financial setbacks, medical bills, and so forth, Dayton is the person to help you get your money. So he's a very important part of our office. But Patty, today's episode is prompted by a recent newspaper article and a phone call that I just got as a result of that article. And here's the headline. I'll read it to you. Santa Barbara man allegedly ran a $12 million Ponzi scheme indicted on federal fraud and money laundering charges. So this is the U.S. Attorney's Office bringing charges against the Santa Barbara man for a Ponzi scheme. Wow. Well, we've certainly all heard of Ponzi schemes and uh, I think Bernie Madoff is the name that comes to mind. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, for those of you, you will remember it, a Ponzi scheme is when somebody offers to invest your money and give you a great return, but they actually take your money, use it for their own purposes, then use another victim's money to pay you enough returns to keep you invested. So it can be a very vicious cycle. Now, that's what's alleged in this case. And remember, these are only allegations at this point. So every defendant is presumed innocent until he's proven guilty in a court of law. And as I said, this is a federal case prosecuted by the Department of Justice. And it alleges that Daryl Avis solicited money from people who wanted to purchase annuities from a Swiss insurance company. He told his victims that the annuities were safe and secure, and he did not promise big returns. He told the victims they would receive interest ranging from maybe 5 to 7%. Well, I can see why they might have thought he was legitimate and that this was a non-risky investment. That's right, and that's what he was promoting. So it's alleged that he did not purchase the securities, even though he produced statements showing that the value uh, of the purported annuities was increasing over time. Instead, he used the money for his own mortgage payments, luxury car leases, expensive trips, nightclub visits, and in some instances to make payments back to some of the victims. He was recently indicted on five counts of wire fraud and various counts of money laundering. You mentioned you got a phone call from someone about this very case? Yes, I received a call from a gentleman in Illinois who saw the Santa Barbara article and believed that he too had been a victim of this individual. He said he invested with Avis from about 2006 to 2007 gave him a total of $420,000, expecting that Avis would invest in annuities, the annuities would grow, and he could retire on the money. So this year, he finally did retire, and he was supposed to receive quarterly payments with the first one to begin in April 2021. And he did receive that payment. The next payment which was supposed to come in July of this year, never came. So that's when this gentleman got suspicious and found out that he couldn't make contact with Avis. He had disappeared. So he called me and told me his sad story and I was able to refer him to the U US Assistant Attorney General who is prosecuting this case. They were going to send an FBI agent to interview this victim, and hopefully he can get restitution also within the scope of this lawsuit. So this all led Dayton and I to talk about how to pick a good financial advisor. So Dayton, give us some tips about how to do that. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you, Vicki. Number one, I would say the one of the most important things to keep in mind is do not make financial decisions based on emotion. So this is kind of our tip to avoid 
gurus and people who are promoting themselves and who you can see that they have maybe a separate business around promoting themselves and in addition to whatever financial advice they're offering. Um, it's great to get referrals from family and friends, but at the end of the day, do your own research and do your own homework. Um, next thing to think about is interview several people. Don't just go to the first name that you hear um, and find out if they are licensed and registered to sell the type of products that they're selling. Um, and if they are licensed to do business in your state. So for example, if an agent is selling securities, they need to be registered with FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Agency. They're authorized by Congress to protect American investors. And if they're selling real estate, then they need to be a licensed real estate agent. So if you are dealing with an individual and, and they don't pass this test of being licensed or um, the ability to do what they're claiming to do, that needs to be an instant red flag, you know, walk away. Uh, something else to consider is how long has this company been doing business and what is their reputation? Tools to look at this would be something as simple as checking a Yelp review or maybe going on the Better Business Bureau's website and typing in the advisor's name, the business name there and seeing what comes up on the BBB. Next, you should be asking this individual how their fees are structured, meaning how are they going to get paid? Is it going to be a commission based off of what they sell you or is it going to be a flat fee no matter what you choose to buy or not? And this, it really should be something that they are upfront with you about and that they tell you from the very beginning how their fee structure is going to work. And again, if, if they're not upfront with you from the beginning, that would be a red flag. Um, make sure that you understand the services that are going to be provided and the investments that are being offered. If you feel like you're in over your head because you simply don't understand the terminology and the terms of art that are being used, maybe it's time to pump the brakes and do a little bit more research before you commit. Next, ask what type of rate of return you can expect. And then how does that compare with a well-established local firm's return rate? Is there a vast difference between what this individual is offering you and what you might be able to walk in off the street to a Morgan Stanley or a, a, another type of firm and just get from them. If, if there's a vast difference between those two numbers, you want to know why. Um, and what are the risks? What are the risks with, with going with this financial advisor? Another really important thing that came up in the case that Vicky was talking about is communication. How is this person going to be communicating with you about your investments? How often will they be communicating with you? Will this be by email, by phone call, by mailed statements? These are all questions you wanna know before and not at the end when suddenly it's been a couple of years and hey, I, I haven't heard from this person. How am I supposed to get in contact with them? Um, another thing is who holds the money? Is your money being held in a bank account by another third party trusted financial institution? or is your money being held in the advisor's personal bank account? And that has its own risks. You need to know the answers to this ahead of time. And lastly, the most important thing to remember is if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. I hate right? that that's the case. I know. <laughs> I do too. That's so often it is the case. It We've is. said that over and over, over again. Over and over. Gosh, what yeah. great advice, Dayton. That well, really is very helpful. Thank you. It is. Thank you so much, Dayton, for doing the Absolutely. research on that and, and yes. putting that together. We appreciate it. We do. Yes. We hope you'll join us again soon. I'd love to. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye. Vicki, I hear you have a special guest with us today to share good news. I do indeed. This is my friend Jeannie West, who is the Community Engagement Manager at Hospice of Santa Barbara. And Patty, if you recall, last week, my good news was that the Department of Justice was beginning its third distribution of forfeited funds to compensate victims of uh, fraud that had been facilitated by Western Union. 
So this was the third batch that they were sending out of uh, funds collected from Western Union to reimburse victims of fraud that had used Western Union to send off the money to fraudsters. Well, our own Jeannie West got caught up with a fraud some years ago, as I recall, and she is here to tell us the end result of that whole event. So Jeannie, oh, share some good Jeannie. news with us. Yes, every now and then a little sun comes out after the rain, as they say. Do you want me to give a little overview of the event itself and then the outcome? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was in 2009 that I had the misfortune of falling prey to one of the um, Craigslist scams. I had okay. put on Craigslist some items uh, from the house, but also some personal items that were the result of my being a caregiver for my husband who had died a few months earlier. One of which was a lift chair, one of those recliners that lifts you from sitting to standing position. And strange as it seems to me, that was the first item of interest that was uh, came through an email saying, Oh, I am so interested in that chair. I hope it hasn't been sold yet. And the person went on and on, indicating that they had a disability. So my little heart's pounding, thinking, oh gosh, it's going to go to the right person. I just know it. So the individual via back forth said, may I send you it? I said, well, I'm not really wanting to take checks. Well, it seemed as though there was no way the person could get the item without sending a check. So sure enough, the check comes in the mail uh, for I believe $2,000. And then I get a panic email saying, oops, mistake. The bank sent my entire payroll check and they were only supposed to send $600. I hope you didn't send the money and I hope that you'll send it back to me and of course, Oh, the very honest person that I am saying, oh, yes, 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 of, of course I have the money and of course I'll send it back. Warning, warning, mm -hmm. guess how to send it back was supposed to happen. Wire it. And wire the uh, entire amount, less the amount of the chair, to... Um, this person at a different location. I mean, audience, I have to tell you, every warning signal was there. Wiring the money, the, the check was going to go to someone at an entirely different location than what the con artist uh, seemed to indicate uh, where she lived, if it was a she. There were misspellings in the email. I mean, every warning signal was there. But my little sad heart pitter-patter went, send the money. Long story short, two weeks later, the bank called, the check bounced. And of course, the saga goes on from there. And I did what so many other people who have been caught in the trap have done, um, wiring the money via uh, Western Union. Mm -hmm. So along comes Vicky several years ago, and I need to tell you, as a result of that, after crying and berating myself for weeks that I could be so foolish, um, I just said, you know, I'm a person of faith. Lord, let this incident enable me to help other people. Let me get involved to say it can happen to the best or the worst of us. So here we are now in 2019 or 20, and Vicki tells us about Western Union um, involved in a law case with the United States government because they took so much money from unsuspecting victims like myself and wired it when in fact uh, 
they should have known better. And it, it's interesting because looking back now, I even said to the Western Union agent, does this look legitimate? Is, I mean, where I'm sending this? And of course, um, despite all my warnings, I went ahead and sent the money. So I'm, I'm really the one at fault here. But when Vicki heard of the case by the US government against Western Union, she said, to everybody at other prevention council meeting, file a claim. What do you have to lose? So I went through my bank records hoping I could find details and I at that point could only find the date of the transaction because it was in 2009, now we're in 2019. Right. So I filed the claim, nothing happened. And about, I'd say 10 months ago, I got a letter saying um, that there was insufficient evidence. If I found anything else that might substantiate the claim, refile. As luck would have it, or fine intervention, I found the file of all the transactions, of the police report, of um, the wired transaction, I had all the numbers. So here we are, it's now 2020. This is 11 <laughs> years, can you wow. believe it? I resubmitted it with copies of everything and all the numbers. A week ago, Saturday, I got the check in the mail for $1,980. Wow, that's such a great Isn't story. Isn't that fantastic? I, I love yeah, that story. Yeah. yeah. That is a wonderful story, Jeannie. And, you know, thank you so much for sharing. And it really encourages all of us to go ahead and report. Because like you say, what have you got to lose? So report things to IC3. If a, an opportunity like this comes along, make a report. It took you all those many years, but you got your money back. So yay. Yay. I know, I know <laughs> that I found file was amazing because honestly, without it, without the exact numbers, yeah, I, I wouldn't have had a chance. And even at the fact that um, I submitted it so long ago, in fact, I pulled the file out because I wanted to tell you, I rewrote it November 2nd of 2020. And here wow. we are, July. Yeah. And I, had I, I, was, I was so excited, uh, Jeannie, when you shared that news with me. It was just a, a great thing. You know, it's not often that we get really good news like that, meaning money true? back. And uh, yeah. here you go. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Jeannie, and sharing that wonderful news. We appreciate you. You are Jeannie. so welcome. And to the listeners out there, tell your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've all fallen traps to some con artist at some point in our life, whether it's a door salesman or, or something like this. So share this story because had I not shared, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known of the remedies. Yeah. Thank you. And what a great ending for this week's show. And Vicki, could you share the fraud hotline phone number? Yes. Area code 805-568-2442. 805-568-2442. So Until next week. Bye-bye now. Bye.